All right, I think we will uh, start our grand rounds today. Thanks to everybody for joining. Um, I'm Carrie Wazinski, the Chief of uh, Palliative Care um, Medical Oncology and Hematology. I put Palliative Care first today because I'm pleased to introduce Dr. Liana Escola, who's one of our Palliative Care physicians. And I hope you've all had the chance to work with her because um, she's an outstanding clinician and colleague. Um, she received her bachelor uh, degree from Haverford College and then went on to get her Doctor of Osteopathic Medicine at the Philadelphia College of Osteopathic Medicine. Subsequently, she went on to finish her residency in family medicine at UC San Diego, and then a fellowship in hospice and palliative medicine here at the UW. In 2017, we were lucky to recruit her to our faculty here at the UW, where she started as an instructor and subsequently as advanced to an assistant professor. Um, and she uh, serves both in our inpatient palliative uh, uh, care program, taking care of patients, as well as she was the founder of the Heart Failure Palliative Care Clinic, and she has also been the associate program director for the fellowship program and leads the narrative medicine program in the fellowship. She also serves at our uh, veterans hospital and leads the palliative uh, medicine program there. Uh, she in 2019 received the John Peterson uh, Palliative Care Educator Award and she has lectured uh, many levels from medical students to residents and fellows across our institution. Um, she's a true leader in this area, and I'm excited to hear her talk today on the uses of narrative, mending the social fabric of medicine. Dr. Escola. Thank you so much, Dr. Wazinski, for that kind introduction. So I am going to jump right in, not surprisingly, perhaps, with a story. And the story uh, is about me. And I have struggled a lot in putting together this presentation with trying to decide, you know, how much of myself do I bring to this presentation? How much data do I present to you about storytelling and why it matters? And uh, what I've come back to is that, you know, we in medicine are all human and we all bring ourselves to the practice of medicine. And that's why I'm going to start with a story about myself. So... I'm a palliative care doctor, and I thankfully get to spend my working hours connecting with my patients and their families in really profound ways in often are what the worst are the worst moments of their lives. And um, that's a privileged position. I have only very recently, over the last four years, had a lot of experiences as a patient myself. And um, I was diagnosed with unexplained infertility four years ago. And as a result, I have seen many, many doctors, been through many treatments. And um, all of this culminated in a really scary moment. Um, one year and eight days ago, I found myself in our own emergency department um, suffering from a potentially life-threatening complication from yet another cycle of IVF I had just been through. And while I had already been through a lot up until that moment in my medical treatment, it had still felt elective to some degree, but now it really wasn't elective. I was in a medical emergency. I was very sick. I was frightened. I was out of my element to, to be sure. And this really was one of the first times that I had a taste of what our patients might feel like. I'm very lucky and privileged, obviously, to have made it 37 years before feeling that way. Uh, but it was still scary and hard. And the great thing about our hospital is I got world-class care. I got care that was by the textbook. Things could not have gone more smoothly with all of my medical care. And yet I found myself still feeling terribly frightened, um, sleep deprived, in pain, uh, isolated. And it's made me think a lot about how the healthcare system is composed how we provide treatment, but how it's not really set up to allow us as clinicians to provide care. I have come to feel that treatment and care really are two different things. And in thinking about this, I realized that the human beings who helped me when I was sick did exactly what they were supposed to do, exactly what they were trained to do. And it was not their fault that I felt scared, isolated, confused. I was taken care of by very good people. Yet, the way that I now approach patients and families um, after my illness is very different as a result of having experienced a terrifying illness myself. And I found that I've actually had to unlearn many of the habits that I was taught as part of both the explicit and implicit curricula in my medical training. 
So some of what I'm going to share with you today comes from that. It comes from my interest in what happens when a sick, vulnerable, scared person shows up at a hospital asking for help and a healthcare worker comes to their aid. Because in that moment, really wonderful, life-changing things can happen as a result of affirming relationships in the healthcare setting. Or there can be disconnection, broken trust, and missed opportunities for healing through connection. So my objectives for today is at the end of this presentation, you will be able to articulate the relationship between empathy, burnout, clinician well-being, and connection in the healthcare setting. You'll be able to discuss the power of language and narrative as tools for connection, and you will be able to plan how to integrate narrative approaches into your own skill set. So some of you are thinking, hey, that's a picture of a Western blot. <laughs> we were just talking about stories a second ago. And I'm including this because I think many of you, I know many of you are scientific experts who are used to looking at data and extracting stories from data. And my purview while including data like yours um, is also really in human relationships under the most dire of circumstances. And um, so I'm gonna talk about that. I'm gonna talk about stories about you and me as clinicians and our relationships with each other, um, stories of our patients and why they matter. So the outline of how I'm gonna accomplish that today is first to talk about the therapeutic relationship and the people in it. Um, spoiler alert, there are some problems. I am gonna talk about what can be done though. And narrative medicine is part of that. Narrative medicine and storytelling how it can bolster the therapeutic relationship and how language, storytelling and empathy connect all of us in the healthcare setting. This wouldn't be complete without talking about some critiques of narrative medicine, so I'll be certain to do that as well. And then we'll wrap up by talking about um, how you can adopt some narrative approaches to improve your own well-being and your relationships with your patients. So first, the therapeutic relationship. What is this nebulous thing? Um, it's a clinician and a patient co-creating a working relationship that is both reliable and effective. It's an active and engaged partnership where patients feel heard and understood. And there are really important contributions from both parties. And a lot of research has found that the relationship clinicians have with their patients are actually a key driver of a bunch of different clinical outcomes. But for docs to show up and be effective in that relationship, they have to have an inner um, ability to feel empathy. And um, we're not doing so great there necessarily. I'm gonna talk about why that is. But um, a year before the pandemic, up to 50 to 55% of us were actually really burnt out and considering leaving healthcare. It was much worse for our trainees, medical students and nurses, up to 60% of them before the pandemic were considering um, leaving or were feeling really burnt out from their work. And now, um, you know, in the pandemic, we have up to three in 10 of us as of February, 2021, who were like pretty committed to the idea of leaving healthcare forever. That's a huge drastic thing for people like us um, who really care about our work. And then just a couple months later in June of 2021, up to 61% of doctors were feeling burnt out. That was like a 20% increase. And the rates, not surprisingly, were worse for women, for primary care doctors, and for doctors under the age of 40, 45, so younger folks. This is all pretty bad. There's this really illuminating quotation that I read in an article from The Atlantic where this primary care doctor named Dr. Sheetal Rao, um, who ended up leaving medicine entirely in October of 2020 said, in my experience, physicians are some of the most resilient people out there. And when this group of people starts leaving en masse, something is very wrong. And I really couldn't agree more. If we fast forward to this year, just a couple months ago, February, 2022, USA Today and Ipsos did a poll of about 1200 healthcare workers. So all comers, not just doctors, but they found that 22% of them are, are burnt out, which is sort of a plateau. Maybe that's a little bit reassuring, but they also have some really positive, powerfully positive actually emotions, things like 
feeling hopefulness, motivation, and optimistic. And I found that really interesting because I think it speaks to some of the deep wells of resilience and commitment that we have to taking good care of people um, in the face of profound systemic failures that get in our way of doing that. So then how do our patients feel about us? From a 2019 Pew Research Center study, they found that about 74% of Americans have a mostly positive overall view of doctors. Not bad. But only 57% of them felt that we doctors care about our patients' best interests all or most of the time. That number is not as high as I would have expected. And the ABIM Foundation commissioned a study in 2021, so a little more recently, on the reasons for why people, people feel that they don't necessarily trust their doctors. And some of it is stuff that we really feel we can't control or is hard to control, like they spend too little time with me here in the upper right-hand corner. But the two that really struck me the most were 14% of people feeling that their doctors don't necessarily know them. And another 14% feeling that their doctors don't necessarily listen to them. So what I've sort of taken from all these statistics and data is that number one, we as physicians and a lot of other folks in healthcare feel burnt out. And up to a third of us as recently as last year, we're considering leaving healthcare forever. We are also um, resilient, hopeful, and optimistic people, but we are emotionally exhausted. And while our patients generally have favorable opinions of us, uh, just over half of them think that we have their best interests at heart. And they don't necessarily believe that we know them well um, or that we listen. And so all of this has led me to the conclusion that the therapeutic relationship and people in it really are suffering. So the question of course then is what are we gonna do about this? Um, I work with many people who are incredibly caring, kind folks, and they might say to themselves, I just have to try harder. Um, maybe this is some kind of personal failing that my patients are not feeling cared for. But the reality is very far from that. There are so many systemic forces that are working on us um, that produce burnout. It's a complicated phenomenon. It's a systems issue. It is not just you. And the thing I think about is when it comes to systems issues, we cannot wait for a system to reform itself entirely um, because we'll be waiting a really long time for healthcare reform, for a living wage for all of our patients. Um, we have to think about what are we gonna do on an individual level to help ourselves and help our patients feel more connected. And the good news is that there are very good um, person level or individual level interventions like therapy and mindfulness that have excellent levels of evidence um, that they make us as clinicians feel less burned out and feel better. And there's also really good evidence for individual level behaviors that we bring to the clinical encounter that make our patients feel cared for and also lead to concretely positive outcomes for them. Um, everything from improved satisfaction and adherence to symptom resolution, better quality of life and reduced mortality. All of those positive outcomes can come out of a supportive clinician patient relationship. So this all has me thinking, you know, working at the individual level um, in the face of systemic failures that we face, driving us apart from our patients, how do we maintain a sense of connectedness and care? And one of the, the answers or potential answers I have been exploring in my academic career is that of narrative medicine and narrative competence. So narrative medicine is a field founded by Dr. Rita Sharon, who's a Columbia internist, came about in the late 1990s, and she was studying um, for her PhD in English literature. And the field of study of hers was actually narratology, which is the structure and function of stories. And she developed a theory out of her work that doctors would be better doctors if they could understand people's stories. So narrative medicine by definition is an approach to medicine that employs narrative skills to augment the scientific understanding of illness. And the skill set that comes out of that is called narrative competence, which is the competence that we as human beings use to absorb, interpret, and respond to stories. And where this came from um, was really a return to humanism and medicine that arose uh, after the Tuskegee syphilis study came to light. 
in the early 1970s. There was a resurgence of bioethics, of humanism in medicine, and in the 1980s, a bunch of books started coming out that championed the concept of, in order to treat patients properly, we as doctors have to attempt to understand their illness experience ourselves, and that biomedical mechanistic approaches alone really aren't sufficient to promote true healing. And some of the foundational texts that arose were The Body in Pain by Elaine Scarry, I believe in 1985, and the illness narratives by a physician anthropologist, Arthur Kleinman, um, who's actually a, a psychiatrist. And the illness narratives is really a foundational text, one that I read a long time ago when I was in college. And narrative medicine arose from this milieu in the late 1990s. And two landmark reports really quite recently, one in 2018 from the National Academies and one from the AAMC in 2020, have reinforced the concept that um, arts and humanities are essential in medical education because applying them produces emotionally intelligent clinicians, essentially. And I wanted to share with you a, sort of a representative quotation from the AAMC report because I think it says it all. They said, professional growth and transformation occur when we adopt the perspective of others through sustained attention as well as when we think critically and compassionately about human dilemmas. This leads to the ability to integrate one's deep fund of knowledge, ethical sensibilities, and emotional intelligence to know how to do the right thing in this circumstance with this patient. All well and good. How do you teach that? So the way I think about um, teaching narrative medicine, first of all, is this is well studied and the basic framework is having people listen to stories, reflect upon stories and be moved to act by stories. There are a bunch of ways to do this in the didactic setting. Um, so I co-teach a medical humanities course at the School of Medicine and Public Health with clinicians from the Department of Family Medicine, Pediatrics, Neurology, um, we're a, a motley crew. And one of the frameworks we use is studied extensively um, and is found in the vast majority of sort of studied narrative medicine interventions called read, reflect, respond. And it involves reading something, often a piece of fiction, and then a small group of people reflecting on what they've read, discussing it, and then responding by writing something of their own and sharing it with their group. So that read, reflect, respond paradigm is used a lot in the didactic setting. We also use an observational tool, a bunch of observational tools to help students hone their perceptual abilities and encourage an understanding of context when they are reading. Um, one we use, for instance, is called the framework for close reading, which uses a set of questions for structured inquiry into a text or a story. And these types of exercises are meant to help clinicians develop two types of skills. One is receptive or listening skills, and the other is interpretive or reflective skills. And this set of skills have been found to transfer directly to people's abilities to reflect on their own practice um, and improve their own well being, creating a better relationship with themselves, essentially, this first bar up here. These reflective, um, and interpretive or listening skills have also been found to improve clinicians' ability to empathically engage with their patients. And I think the greater hope of people who practice narrative medicine interventions is that by doing this on a person-to-person -person basis, it will help change the overall public's relationship with doctors and with clinicians as a whole. So I've talked about what this looks like um, or can look like in the didactic setting. And now I'm gonna show you a, a video introduction of what this can look like in the clinical setting. Uh, this video is an introduction to the My Life, My Story program, which some of you may be familiar with, started at the Madison VA back in 2013. And it has since spread to over 60 other VAs as a best practice all over the country. And is now starting to spread throughout the private sector or non-VA sectors, I suppose I should say, for instance, a bunch of University of California campuses. So I'm gonna play you just this short little video introduction, which Clint and I tested, so it should work. Here we go. 
My first one was amazing. I mean, well, yeah, it was really amazing. It was this man I took care of in our um, inpatient hospice unit. He had never talked about Vietnam, but what he said was that if you'll really, if you really want to know and you'll really listen, then I'll tell you. And so I said yes, and I sat down, and he he. Whoops! Sorry, we're gonna start a little bit later. My first, my I'll bad. Tell you. And so I said yes. And I sat down and he, he told me a lot. He told me a lot. And then after that, I wrote it up and he liked it and he gave it to his wife and then he gave it to his daughter and then he gave it to the son-in-law. And then he kept asking for more and more and more copies to give it to his family because he liked, he liked his story and seeing it that way, it was just different. And what came out of that was a lot of the relatives said to us and said to him was that, when you came back from Vietnam, your parents told us not to talk about it, not to ask you about it, so we didn't. And then here we are so many years later, and it became this um, really beautiful, meaningful thing for him. I think often people know how to talk to someone and hear about their life and get to know them as a person. And there's something about the medical training where sometimes we almost unlearn that skill what patients really want is for you to understand what's important to them. Tell me who you are as a person. Tell me what matters to you. Well, I think that like sort of taking off the white coat and being, we don't have to be completely vulnerable, but we do have to be open to, to knowing how we feel with the patient. pretty nervous at first, to be honest. This helps us connect in a different way with structured questions, so we're able to feel that feeling of connecting with someone. I did end up um, kind of uncovering or learning uh, information about the patient that was a bit close to home for him. Having that kind of dedicated time to just talk about what matters to these people, as people, not just patients, is really different. So My Life, My Story is an amazing project that takes trainees who rotate through the VA and gives them an opportunity to actually get to know some of their patients as people and get to hear veterans' life stories. In this case, we're sort of formalizing the humanistic side of medicine. What's really exciting about it is the fact that it goes in the medical record and so it enables other team members to then learn about the person. I mean, how you could spend, you know, one hour of your time with one patient and make them feel so valued and it's tangible. It's they special. Can, yeah. It was an amazing experience um, and still the, the most unique patient interaction that I've had throughout my third year. It's not about adding to the conversation, it's about changing the conversation. So, as you may have surmised, the My Life, My Story intervention is a structured interview um, that in that example is being done by, by students at the Boston VA that results in a written story about um, a patient's life that is then posted in the medical record. And while this is a homegrown program that started at our, our VA next door, um, it has gotten major press coverage in the New York Times, NPR, the Washington Post, Wall Street Journal, um, for very good reason. The studies that are starting to come out about My Life, My Story have shown promising outcomes. Uh, this study, for instance, was a 2021 perspective study of a little over 50 UCSF medical students that showed that My Life, My Story interventions for students resulted in them learning how to elicit a life story, gaining perspective taking skills, um, regardless of how the interview was done, whether it was uh, face to face over telephone or on video. This was does, done during the pandemic. 
and another study done at UCSF of first and third year medical students on their medicine rotation who were required to participate as interviewers in My Life, My Story. Um, they found statistically significant improvements in a bunch of different measures of empathy, essentially. So the students uh, afterwards were more able to recognize patients' thoughts and feelings, to be attentive and responsive, to be caring and to show genuine interest in a patient's situation. So I'm gonna switch gears now to start talking about some of the narrative medicine interventions that are underway at UW within the section of palliative care, which is my home. And the very first I wanted to tell you about is a writer's group that we have had since 2016. So I am now the faculty lead of this program, which was started by Dr. Toby Campbell, very nice picture down there in the right corner. And the goal was to help, um, help the participants gain some creative writing skills, but also helping them feel more connected with one another while they were doing it. And this program is led by Michelle Wilgen, who's an author, novelist, editor, um, formerly from Tin House Press, a major literary press. And we meet about seven times throughout the academic year, once a month, generally for a little over an hour. Uh, used to be in person, been over Zoom for the majority of the last two years, unfortunately. But I'm told it's still working well. And the structure is we read bits of fiction together, we reflect on them. Uh, and then we respond by writing pieces ourselves. And we share them with each other in class, um, get to know each other in sort of a different way. And then at the very end of the year, we do a public reading at a local bookstore. We had our most recent public reading last month and we had about 40 folks come masked in person and a bunch of other people tuning in to the live stream on the internet. Uh, and it's really an amazing experience. It was especially an amazing experience to be back in person together after uh, two years of really not being able to do that kind of sharing um, in person. And our participants in general are, are four palliative care fellows each year, and then four faculty members, generally from the section of palliative care, but we have also included oncologists, neurologists, pediatricians, folks from hospital medicine, uh, and so far we have trained 24 fellows and 22 different faculty members. This has resulted in a bunch of us including narrative medicine in their academic careers like me, uh, people publishing their work. And it's still, I would say, one of the hallmarks of our palliative care fellowship. Something that arose around the same time that uh, continues to this day and has been really fun and interesting is our use of six word stories in the palliative care program. And so we started doing this, I believe around 2016, and they are exactly what they sound like. They are stories that we tell each other and ourselves about our patients and our work. Uh, they generally have some poignant details or a funny story or an important lesson. And we really use them as a way to cope um, with the tough work that we do, to remember our patients, to reflect on our experiences with them. So I wanted to share just a couple six word stories with you because I think they really speak for themselves. Um, the first here is not a story I wrote, uh, but it's written on the board in our palliative care workroom. <laughs> it says, we're the A team for plan B because that's what a patient called us once. And I just thought that was delightful. Most people are not um, extremely excited to see us at first until they realize how much we can help when things are not going the way they wished they would. Uh, another one I really like is Anxiety Improved with Chaplin and Valium. The reason I love this story so much is because it's a great reminder to me that while as a physician, sometimes my first inclination is to reach for a medication to try to help someone. It's a reminder that the interdisciplinary team in palliative care is, uh, is prime and using all of the resources like chaplaincy can be incredibly helpful for my patients. And the, the last is a story that I wrote because uh, it's something that one of my patients said to me. Uh, they were dying in the hospital and all of their physical needs had been attended to. Emotionally, they were in a very good place. And they said, you know, doc, all I really want now is a nice, cool, minty grasshopper cocktail. Now, I was not the person to get them this grasshopper, I will tell you, but their family member did. And this is yet another good reminder to me that um, patients have very unique needs when they're dealing with serious illness and end of life. Um, so that's the reason I like this story. So now we're gonna do something um, a little unusual. 
I am going to ask each of you to take 30 seconds to write your own six word story about a patient or situation or a case um, that struck you recently. And do your best to keep it HIPAA compliant. You know, no, Miss, Miss Jane Johnson said this in your six word story, uh, but think of a six word story. And if you feel like it, please write it down and share it in the chat. And I will read a few of them at the very end. So I'm gonna give us about 30 seconds where I'm gonna be silent to allow you to write down a six word story. Okay, so another narrative medicine intervention that is underway in our section is an internal podcast called Five Defining Moments. And this is a podcast started by our, our leader, Dr. Toby Campbell, who acts as a supportive interviewer and has us um, share with him on a recording about five different turning points in our lives and how they have shaped us. And then that internal podcast get shared only with members of our section. Each one is about 35 to 40 minutes long. And it is a way for us to get to know each other in a deeper way. And having recently been a person who completed an interview and now has people telling me that they are listening to my interview, it's uh, been really amazing for me to know that I have shared some, some personal vulnerable things with the people I work with, but that um, they have been incredibly supportive and thoughtful and kind and interested in who I am, sort of far beyond what they already knew of me, which is a lot. Uh, so Five Defining Moments has been a, a really cool experience for our section. Narrative medicine interventions, though, are not limited to the palliative care section. Uh, there are ongoing interventions in other departments even. So the Department of Family Medicine and Community Health has this set of writing awards called the John Fry Writing Awards they give out each year. Uh, and it's for creative writing specifically. This is not for um, you know, academic writing or research. And the awards are given out whether um, the work is published or not. I think that's pretty cool. And the Department of Pediatrics also has a new intervention coming up, which I'm a part, called the Listen In Storytelling Collaborative. And if you've ever listen to or watch The Moth. Um, it's a similar idea. A story slam is a place where clinicians um, share their stories and what they mean to them. And this has pretty good research behind it. So Marin Olson out of um, University of Minnesota helped create a storytelling collaborative in the Twin Cities. And they held, they've held a number of story slams or storytelling events and um, so that's where we're pulling our sort of academic grounding for this storytelling event that we're going to have this fall. The idea being that this will help people develop narrative competence, uh, celebrate their shared humanity, feel more connected to one another, um, and motivate us to become advocates for ourselves and for our patients. So save the date for that. The date right now we set it as Tuesday, October 18th. Mark your calendars. And then, of course, at the level of School of Medicine and Public Health, we have Corpus Callosum, which is a fantastic digital arts journal that I hope you all are reading. And the thing I love about it most is that I think it invites us to see ourselves and our colleagues as complex, perceptive, expressive people apart from our work as clinicians. Now, we know from some good experimental data um, that I described earlier that storytelling interventions um, increase empathy and narrative competence. But how exactly does that work? There are a lot of theories about narrative competence um, that describe how it results in cognitive empathy, which we also simply just call empathy. Um, and another term for that is perspective taking or the ability to understand another person's experience while not necessarily like feeling all of their emotions yourself. And cognitive empathy falls under an umbrella of social cognitive skills, which are those skills we bring um, in relating to others where we are able to detect and respond to their emotions. 
And these are really crucial skills that form the basis of human relationships, essentially. And what empathy does on a neurobiochemical level is produce oxytocin release. So if I am the person who is feeling empathy towards someone else, I am releasing more oxytocin than I would otherwise. And oxytocin levels subsequently have been found to correlate with levels of generosity. So if I am uh, secreting more oxytocin, I will behave more generously to other people. And it also affects how trustworthy people perceive us to be. So if we are expressing more empathy, releasing more oxytocin, people believe we are more trustworthy. So there really is a neurobiochemical basis for how this works. Um, and unsurprisingly, that describes you know, why empathy is so important for the social fabric. It really is the glue of our social fabric. And in the clinical encounter, I've had people tell me, you know, I worry about the difference between empathy and countertransference. How do we keep healthy boundaries around ourselves um, to allow us to continue to do our good work? And the important distinction that I think about um, between empathy and countertransference is that empathy is not about feeling the emotions that your patient is feeling. And it's also not about feeling your emotions and placing them onto the, the patient. It's really much more a willingness to try to understand uh, the experience that your patient is having from their perspective, but it doesn't mean you have to take on all the emotions yourself. And the cool thing about cognitive empathy, especially in the clinical encounter, is that it's been found to be related to patient satisfaction, adherence, blood pressure, serum glucose and triglyceride levels, even uh, people's overall health status, their pain levels, even functional status. All of that stuff has been found to directly correlate with clinical empathy. And also, you know, it's not just good for patients. Clinical empathy is good for us too. There was this meta-analysis of 73 studies that showed that um, empathic clinical interactions for clinicians uh, leads to better well-being, less burnout, less stress, and more confidence in communicating in what can be challenging situations. So I really think of empathy as a spark for better outcomes for our patients and more meaningful work for us. And one tool that we've been using um, on the palliative care team at the VA for the last several years to help us spark clinical empathy is something called the Vivid Vignette. And this comes from something called the Humanism Pocket Tool that was created by the homeless primary care team at the Los Angeles VA. Uh, and it's essentially a very short story that is used as the first sentence of an assessment and plan in a chart note. And it emphasizes personhood, goals and desires apart from people's medical conditions. So it's something like, Mr. Jones is a 74 year old retired pastor who is struggling to reconcile his impending death with the concept of a just and loving God. And you might imagine that in order to write something like this about a patient, you have to ask questions like, what matters to you? Uh, what brings you joy? what gets in the way. And it has been incredibly instructive for me to try to use a vivid vignette in 100% of my notes because it forces me to ask those person-centered questions. And it also, interestingly, has kind of changed the way that I see the purpose of my clinical documentation. So I continue to convey the medical picture, you know, describe people's illnesses, list my recommendations, but I find that the vivid vignette can also help other clinicians understand the human being that they're caring for. And while I don't necessarily require all of the residents and fellows I work with to write vivid vignettes, I often will amend or addend their notes to include one. Um, I'm very grateful that they, to they tolerate this, uh, but I think something really cool happens. Um, you know, in this age of us copying forward notes, which we, we all do or copying forward bits of notes, if I include a vivid vignette, it starts showing up in other places in the chart, in other palliative care notes, in nutrition notes, in social work notes. And I love seeing that person-centered language proliferate throughout a chart just from one little thing that one of us has written. And I think this is especially important in the age where patients are now able to read the notes that we write about them. I think that um, person-centered approach matters. And last year's palliative care fellows um, felt similarly and decided to do 
a quality improvement project on the use of vivid vignettes to memorialize their patients. And so they made writing them a routine part of their practice and then studied, studied what it did. And what they found is it helped them feel less burnt out, especially in the case where they were taking care of a patient who died, um, that being able to read the vivid vignette helped them feel less burnt out after the patient died. And it also increased the use of first person language in the health record, unsurprisingly. So one reason why we think that learning about others' stories helps us empathize with them is something called the theory of mind, which is also known as the mind's flight simulator. And it means essentially our ability to attribute mental states to others or to think like other people. And um, this is particularly the case with fiction. Something about reading fiction allows us to try on new identities that might feel very different from our own, but we do that, reading fiction is doing that in a really low stakes way. And this meta-analysis uh, of 53 studies from 2018 concluded that people who read fiction actually outperform others in terms of social cognitive skills like empathy. This was in comparison to people who read nonfiction and people who really just aren't readers and also accounted for people who are more likely to read fiction at baseline. And another study from 2013 looked at what happened when participants read a piece of fiction about the life of a Muslim woman. There were three groups of folks, one who read a large portion of the narrative, like 3000 words, another who read a condensed version, and then another who read an unrelated text. And the results showed that amongst the people who read a full narrative, they had decreased implicit prejudice toward Muslim people. And this was especially the case amongst participants who were not prone at baseline to perspective taking. So something about reading this piece of fiction allowed people to step outside of their usual social roles and sort of investigate and take on someone else's identity um, and made them able to, to take that perspective. So I think that's pretty cool. It's like a, a shortcut to empathy and perspective taking essentially. There's one more mechanism I wanted to share with you on sort of what storytelling does um, for people. And this is about how it connects storytellers and listeners in particular. So this was a study done in 2010 using um, fMRI to describe what happens when one person tells a story and the other one listens. And the teller in this case was sharing an unrehearsed real life story as if they're talking to a friend and it's recorded and all these pictures taken of their brains um, during the telling and the listening. And what they found was that there was significant, significant overlaps in brain activity in a whole bunch of places beyond just simple auditory centers. So places like Broca's area where language production happens, uh, comprehension areas like Wernicke's area and the temporal parietal junction, and then areas where these sort of shared contextual models originate like the precuneus and the medial prefrontal cortex. These are a bunch of areas where social information is processed, um, where successful communication comes from, and particularly areas that are active when we're determining others' desires, beliefs, and goals. So that's pretty interesting. But even without a listener, there are really important things that happen internally when we are writing our own stories. So Tony Bach is a palliative care clinician and researcher from the University of Washington, and his group studied what helps palliative care clinicians, people like me, um, stay well, uh, avoid burnout in the face of really emotionally challenging work. And these include a number of things. One, self-awareness, being able to recognize your own emotions and self-regulate them. Being able to reflect and find meaning in your daily work, uh, returning to your values and purpose through that meaningful work, and then also evolving in the face of challenge, being able to struggle, adapt, change your mindset, have a growth mindset in the setting of a challenge. All of that leads to resilience and transformational growth. And the thing that I really love that you won't find surprising perhaps given the topic is that narrative medicine helps with these. Narrative medicine leads to better self-understanding um, to helping us create or uncover meaning or consider other perspectives in the process of writing and storytelling. It helps us envision different futures. So all of, all of these narrative medicine 
um, interventions really are doing something very concrete for the people who are practicing them. And one study, for instance, found that writing for as little as three minutes on an important personal value has been shown to increase people's self-compassion, improve their pro-social behaviors, a very short time-limited intervention. So let's put this all together. How are, hopefully we've talked about how narrative medicine, uh, clinician well-being, the clinician-patient relationship, and patient well-being are all connected. We know that narrative medicine, utilizing theory of mind and narrative competence, helps to produce more cognitive empathy and improve the clinician-patient relationship. We also know that storytelling and listening to stories produces neural coupling, and that that might have some contribution potentially to the clinician-patient relationship if they're listening to and telling stories. Narrative medicine also can lead to transformational growth, right? Through self-understanding, reflection, evolution, and that leads to well-being. And we know that our personal well-being impacts how we show up in the clinician-patient relationship and how our patients do as a result. Now, I'd be remiss if I didn't include some critiques of narrative medicine, so I'm going to do that. Um, firstly, you might be thinking to yourself, I am not a writer. I'm not interested in expressive writing. It's not my jam. Uh, it may not be a natural coping style for everyone, and that is okay. Um, I think also that when we try to find a story in a patient's history, sometimes that can be harmful because a patient might tell us a chaotic narrative where they're having trouble making heads or tails of what's happening to them. And that itself makes us uncomfortable and often leads us to label people as poor historians, which is a really negative identifier. And I am ashamed to admit that I have done this. I am guilty of doing this. And now in retrospect, it's made me worry that I saw my patient's suffering as less valid, potentially, because of how it was told, because the narrative was chaotic, or I couldn't find a story that made sense to me. And until I was a patient myself, I really didn't understand how hard it is to tell a coherent story with accurate descriptions um, of how I was feeling. And I've started to think that we really ask too much of people when we expect them to do this really well. So what it comes down to for me is to center the person, not the story, especially when we don't understand it. Um, and quite honestly, that's when we need empathy the most. So when we don't know exactly what's going on with our patients. There are also important debates about how and when clinicians should tell stories that involve their patients. Of course, HIPAA and our professional ethics always demand that we protect our patients in all situations. And a good rule of thumb I have used whenever I'm telling a story that includes patient information is that anything they themselves or their family would recognize really needs to be changed. And for people doing this um, in sort of a routine fashion, there are great checklists. The Life's Brand Brown checklist is one that will help you de-identify your story um, you know, from identifiable patient information. So that's helpful. And now we're gonna talk about what you can do um, to develop your own narrative medicine practice and your own narrative competence. And that includes, predictably, reading, listening, and writing. So um, maybe you're not a, a fiction reader, maybe you're not even sure where to start. And if that's the case, that's perfectly okay. Um, I occasionally myself have bouts of feeling like I need to read something, but I don't know what it is. I can't think of anything good. This book, The Novel Cure, is essentially a literary pharmacopoeia that is a great source of um, you know, telling you what you might consider reading based on what ails you. And this is everything from boredom to fear of doing your taxes. This book has a literary remedy for you. So this is a really fun place to start. Um, if you wanna read nonfiction, there are so many good sources like JAMA is a piece of my mind. Uh, Twitter has some amazing physician storytellers. I think it's a great reminder that you, know, you can do this yourself and it's also potentially a source of scholarship if you wanna publish. Now, if you're more of a listener than a reader, there's obviously audiobooks, uh, but there are some really great podcasts out there, including some local ones. Uh, My Life, My Story puts out a podcast that has patient narratives, and there is also a fantastic podcast, and I'm not just saying this because I was a guest, uh, called What Brings You In Today that is produced by 
UW medical students. They have presented at regional conferences about this. Um, it's a really great listen. And last but not least, um, in terms of podcasts, there's The Nocturnist, which if you're not familiar with it, um, this is the first one I would go and listen to, quite honestly. Uh, the Nocturnist started as a story slam type of intervention that changed to the digital realm when the pandemic came on. Their set of COVID diaries are um, audio recordings of clinicians talking about their own experiences during COVID. Many of them have been archived at the Library of Congress and Rana Adish, who gave that amazing Grand Rounds a few weeks ago, actually has her own um, COVID audio diary. It's a great lesson, I highly suggest it. Now, if you're thinking, you know, I, I don't have time to do this outside the clinical realm, that is okay. There are lots of things that you can practice in clinical encounters to help you improve your narrative competence. The very first is listening to your patients. Easier said than done, I am aware. But the thing that keeps coming back to me is a study I read that showed that patients at the beginning of a visit generally only talk for about 92 seconds on average but that we as clinicians tend to cut them off within about 22 seconds. We've all heard this kind of data before, but when we're pressed for time, it feels hard to let people talk. Um, but the reality is that visits where people feel heard and understood are actually much shorter. Um, so if people are talking about emotional content, listening to it and validating it is not only a shortcut to empathy, but it actually makes the visit um, more efficient. And the clinician teach back is one way that I go about this. Um, it's an improvement in narrative competence, or rather this helps me improve my narrative competence. It's also just good medicine. And it's something like listening to a patient history and then saying to the patient, I'm going to repeat back what I think I've heard so that if I don't have it quite right, you can help me correct it. And this has been very useful for me, but it's only useful because I have been willing to accept correction from my patients. Um, you know, it's forced me to elevate the importance of my relationship with the patient over my need to be right. Um, and my patients have been, you know, thankfully very kind in telling me when I don't have it quite right, that that leads to a better relationship um, and a better connection. Now, when it comes to charting, it really is a brave new world um, now that a lot of requirements have changed. You know, Dr. Heidi Twett said in her grand rounds in October, you don't need to repeat the entire history of disease state in your HPI every single visit. And to me, that's meant to a certain extent that we can remake our notes, um, potentially to something really simple. I, of course, have used vivid vignettes a lot, as I described. Uh, they force me to use patient-centered language, may or may not be, you know, the, the kind of intervention or change you want to make, and that's okay. But I think there's a lot of opportunity here. And I wanted to include this tweet by a urologist, Dr. David Keynes, because it just says it so well. This is a fake note, it's not a real patient, but I'm gonna read it to you just because I think it's delightful. He said, Ben returns, he loves gardening. He's particularly proud of his cabbage this season. Stable Bosniak 2F cyst, MRI in six months. Simple, beautiful, I love it. I think something to be aware of too is that uh, really large scale, good quality studies, including one that came out earlier this year, have shown that implicit bias shows up in our notes. Black patients, for instance, are two and a half times more likely to have negative identifiers like non-adherent, non-compliant, uh, difficult in their notes. And so our language really matters. Our language is telling micro stories, whether we like it or not. And there are some good best practices to think about in that realm. There are things like using person first language, saying a person with hypertension, not a hypertensive, um, avoiding pejoratives like alcoholic, narcotic, sickler, drug user. These are intensely negative terms to talk about uh, people. Using inclusive language like spouse instead of husband and wife benefits our queer patients. And avoiding labels like non-compliant or poor historian. Using patient quotations to emphasize what they're saying, not to delegitimize. Saying stress at home is delegitimizing, not necessarily affirming. And all of this, um, I was, sorry, I forgot one, not leading with social identifiers. So talking about a person's race, ethnicity, or language in the one-liner 
is something that um, is recommended to stay away from based on this Healy study from 2022. So all of this helps to humanize our patients in our words. Now, apart from the clinical sphere, one last plug for writing on your own. If you've never kept a journal, I think it's worth considering. Uh, studies have found that amongst medical students, it doesn't matter how well they write or don't write, um, how good those skills are or are not. What matters is that they get words down on paper, and that is a useful form of reflection. The New York Times has some pretty good tips about scheduling it. 15 minutes a few times a week is probably enough. Writing things out by hand, dating your entries, and using a simple prompt like a tough case that's still on your mind is helpful. So we've arrived at the end of the story for today. And the conclusions that I have personally come to in my exploration and use of narrative medicine interventions is that relationship and connection in the healthcare setting is medicine itself. It is treatment. And while narrative won't fix health inequities, it won't fix our trauma and depression, um, Narrative competence is a useful set of skills that helps clinicians and patients feel mutually heard and understood and connected. And it's a valuable tool that you can access right now, um, costing no money whatsoever. So um, before I say my thank yous and then take questions, I'm just gonna take like 30 seconds to hopefully read a few six word stories. Oh good, there are a bunch. Oh, this is so exciting. Okay, so I'm gonna read like three or four of them. Uh, so Kate Ford Roberts, who is a, a dear, dear clinician I work with says, I'm dying, want to go home. Home meant heaven to him. <laughs> wow, someone else says, let's see what life brings next. I love that. Another, another clinician says, let me bring home to you. That's beautiful. Ah, let's end with this one because it's really good. It's all about the patient, period. Love that. So yes, in my last, uh, my last moments I have with you to control the narrative here, I'm just gonna say a thank you really quick to all of the people on the screen. There are people who've helped me develop my narrative competence uh, build, you know, build relationships through narrative competence, caring for myself, my patients, other clinicians. Um, and they are not just doctors. They are nurses, social workers, chaplains, poets, therapists, researchers. Um, and they have helped me become a better clinician as a result of, of pushing me to see people's humanity in every moment when it's hard, when I'm pressed for time. So, Thank you very much for listening. Um, I put my email here in case you are someone who is interested in storytelling in medicine, wants to learn more, wants to get involved. Please ping me and I'll now be glad to take your questions. Thank you. That was outstanding. Uh, just inspiring. Uh, I will moderate a few questions uh, and try to be respectful of time too. So one was about uh, the, the teaching that we do in medicine about using first person language and documentation, not including it. Do you have any guidance on that? On not including? Yeah, person should person? first person language be included in documentation or not? Huh. I think, um, you know, what I would say about that is that person first language has been shown to change clinician behavior. So if um, using pers first and first language person first language, is something that helps you treat the human being in front of you more like a human, um, then it can be helpful. There are a lot of good studies about how people from underrepresented groups feel about person first language. And I think, you know, the good rule of thumb is to learn about the community you're serving, learn about the types of person first language that they find helpful and acceptable, and to use that. Wonderful. Um... You know, I think we're at time. So the oh, other shoot. two that are in there, no, it's okay. It was an outstanding talk. So <laughs> I think I'm going to be respectful of people's time and send them on their way. But there was a, a little bit more about EMR documentation. So maybe we can talk about those offline. So Sounds thanks good. everybody for joining today and have a good day. Thank you.